So this is going to be about encrypted cloud storage, as you might guess from the title, and specifically about uh, a security review, an independent security review we did of this uh, Spider One application and what we found. So the basic goal will be to, to see, you know, what do they claim to provide and what do they actually provide in terms of security. So this will be basically what I'm going to be talking about. So I'll start by describing the threat model we used for this review. Then I'll describe at a very high level how this Spider Oak application works. And then I'll show some attacks on how this can, uh, the security can be broken. And as a small disclaimer here, uh, we did report all our issues. And if you're using Spider Oak, then you should just use the newest version. I guess that holds for all software. All right. <coughs> so I think I'll start by comparing, you know, or trying to motivate encrypted cloud storage. That might seem, I don't know, silly at a conference full of cryptographers, but I'll try anyway. Um, so traditional cloud storage, I think, has some privacy concerns. For example, you know, besides ourselves, the user, who else can read our files? If our files are basically stored in plain text on the server, then anyone with access to the server can essentially read these files. And that's probably a problem. There's also this issue of you know, what happens if we, when we delete files. Are they actually securely deleted? Um, and the same holds when we close our account. So you know, the files that we had at some point, are they totally gone now from the server? Or is there still some you know, uh, leftovers, basically? And, that's not so cool, maybe. And finally, you know, what happens if this cloud storage um, gets sold, or cloud storage company gets sold? So it might be that we are fine with the company as it is now, but if it's suddenly sold to somebody else who has a different approach to um, managing user data and so on, then we might not be too happy about this. But essentially, we have no real control over the files that we store in this uh, service, so we cannot really control it after you know it's sold. And the solution, I guess, is obvious, right? We just encrypt everything on the client before we send it to the server, and hopefully, you know, all the client or all the server sees is encrypted files, and he shouldn't be able to use that for anything, really. All right. So, but this this like begs the question, you know, that this encrypted cloud storage ECS, it should give something more in terms of security than regular cloud storage. Uh, in particular, I think we want our files to stay secure even if the server turns malicious. So. All of the points I had before uh, can basically be considered as you know, some kind of malicious server. The server starts looking at our files or poking around in them and, and so on. And it also seems that real products basically agree with this sentiment that you know, we do not necessarily have to trust the server. So I've taken all of these uh, quotes from the various websites, and they all basically seem to be saying the same, that you, know, you should not necessarily have to trust the server or your files stay secure no matter what, and, and so on. And it's the bottom one we'll be focusing on uh, in this talk. OK. Uh, the question is, of course, you know, is this malicious uh, server threat model thing, is that actually used? So for this Spider Oak case, after we disclosed these issues to Spider Oak, they wrote this blog post basically stating that it was built in a time before they considered this threat model, and therefore, it is not secure against this malicious server. So that's too bad. But I guess that you know, spoils, the, spoils the results that we actually did found, find some, some issues in this, if it's not secure, per their claim. Uh, finally, there has been some previous work on, on looking at these cloud storage company, or cloud storage, uh, encrypted cloud storage services, and the kind of security they provide. So I've taken two examples here that uh, consider Spider Oak in particular. And you know, one of them, the top one, considers an external adversary in, in the form of some kind of web adversary. And the bottom one considers only file sharing and shows that uh, the server can actually read the file. So when you share a file with somebody else in this application, you lose this guarantee of, of security, basically. And this file sharing I'll get back to because it's a bit worse than this. All right, so, so our threat model is, is pretty simple. So we assume an honest client for, I think, obvious reasons. Um, Otherwise, it's not so, no, so fun to look at. And since we are um, talking in the context of you know, a real application that we want to assess the security of, uh, this simply means that we receive this software from the server before the server turns evil. Um, and it's kind of necessary because, of course, if we start assuming or start you know, looking at what happens with the server turns evil, um, an obvious question is, of course, but the server, you know, it could just upload a broken client. Uh, so we don't consider that because then security would be, I don't know, 
hard to analyze. So informally, our threat model looks at basically two questions. So first of all, are we secure against some kind of passive adversary? So if all the server does is look at the files we have, uh, we are storing, um, but otherwise does not do anything out of the ordinary, are we then secure? So I guess this, this should be pretty clear that this, is, should, this should at least hold, right? Because otherwise there's no point in doing all of this. Then we're no better than a regular cloud storage uh, solution. The other thing we looked at is what happens if the server suddenly starts deviating in some, some sense. So, of course, um, this cloud storage uh, or these cloud storage applications are in, uh, in essence, some you know, client-server protocol. So, of course, there's a lot of communication between the client and server, and a question is, of course, you know, what could the server do actually that is, it would not normally do, and how does the client react to this? So, specifically, you know, the protocols that it has, and can these be misused? And again, since we're considering a, considering, uh, a real application, there's also the question of uh, the client's implementation. Uh, finally, we do provide this in a bit more formal way, uh, in our paper, which can be viewed, it's on ePrint, and it's basically just an indistinguishability experiment between a uh, and, yeah, client and a server. It's, um, I think most of you have seen such kinds of th or, um, definitions possibly a hundred times or something like that, right? Uh, and our definition only considers confidentiality, so it's really the very minimal, I think, that we would want from one of these products. Okay, so SpyDog 1, some very basic facts about this application. So it's an encrypted cloud storage application, and it has received some praise or endorsements from both Edward Snowden and the EFF. So if you care about these uh, authorities in, in popular privacy or what have you, then this, uh, this is a nice attribute to have, I think. It uses this interesting um, name, no knowledge, for their encryption routines, and before that they use zero knowledge. Uh, and it's important here to note that this zero knowledge has nothing to do with cryptographic zero knowledge. It's more like saying that we have zero knowledge of what you're storing because we're encrypting data. And that's also what actually led us to um, look at or consider Spider Oak in the first case because we thought it was very interesting that they use this name without really you know, considering that it actually has a proper def definition. Okay. Um, it supports all the media operating systems. Nothing fancy there. There's some partial support for Android and iOS. It supports file sharing. It's written in Python, so it's easy to decompile. That was nice. It uses certificate pinning in TLS, which means that the attacks that we do found, find um, cannot actually be run by somebody outside, because an outside attacker would, of course, have to break this TLS thing to run the attacks we find. Of course, that's easy for the server, because the server is the intended recipient of the client's data. And we did our review on this 615, which was the newest, release, or newest version last, uh, last year when we did this. <clears throat> All right, communication very roughly looks like this. So it proceeds in two parts. There's an authentication part, which is only run on install. So when you install the application the first time, either as part of a new account or just installing it on a new computer, the server gets to pick which protocol to run. Uh, for some reason, there's four protocols that the client will run, but it only runs two of them. Um, and so the, the inter or the important thing here is that the server actually chooses this. So, of course, a question I'll come back to is, you know, what happens if we run, run one of these protocols that is not actually run? And, of course, this being a pro or I shouldn't say that. Uh, this being, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's, uh, uh, yeah, all of the protocols are non-standard, basically homemade. So, this is also interesting, I think. Um, whether or not that's a good idea is, of course, up to debate, I think. Um, everything else basically is done using RPC calls uh, in a Python library. And this is surprisingly comprehensive for a, um, an application that basically just uploads and downloads data. So there's around 90 different procedures that the server can actually call on the client. That's of course also very interesting to analyze. Encryption in the application is done like this. So if you store a file f, this is, uh, means that you would derive a key in this way by hashing f together with this mk, which is a random string. These KFs or KFs keys, so file keys are encrypted with a per directory key. So you have, an, a, um, you have a unique key per file, and then to protect all of these file keys, you use a key per directory. All of these directory keys is then encrypted by some long-term key. So a long-term key is just a key that is created when you create the account, and then it's just the same forever. And finally, these long-term keys are encrypted by uh, a key derived from the user's password. So 
Of course, everything in the end depends on the user's password for security, and then it gradually, I guess, fans out uh, as you go down this uh, tree on the right. A small note here about password changes. So if you wanted to get some sort of future secrecy, you know, if you break one of these keys, then you'd have to rotate it uh, at some point when you change your password. Unfortunately, this does not happen. So if you change the password in the application, only the encryptions of these long-term keys are actually recomputed. But the keys themselves are not changed or anything. So if you know these long-term keys, then changing the password does not you know, give you some sort of uh, future secrecy here. All right. Oh, I'm, yeah, right. So this is basically what we found. So we for, found four different issues that we could actually use uh, to attack the client. And what this means is that there were some issues, or we found some issues in the, um, in the client that the server in some ways can trigger, and this degrades security in some uh, definable or measurable way. So we found one uh, issue, the first one here, which basically weakens the security of a hash drive from the user's password. So one of these authentication protocols I talked bef uh, about before is basically just asking or sending uh, some parameters to the user and asking him to derive uh, a hash. Of course, you know, if the server is malicious, he can choose these parameters in such a way that this goes wrong or this uh, degrades security. There's also some, some interesting uh, consequences of using uh, a pretty out-of-date Python library in this, but I'll skip this uh, uh, part. Then we found two attacks that can recover the user's password, and one of them is totally without the user actually knowing what's going on. This is, of course, pretty bad, I think. Um, and then we found one attack, which in some situations will recover files uh, that are actually not shared. So this, the last one here means that in some situations where you share uh, concretely a directory, you would actually end up revealing files that are not part of the directory to the server also, which is interesting. Um, to get back to this active-passive thing uh, we have in our threat model, uh, the two password recoveries are active, so they require the server to do something it shouldn't do. Um, the passive one is basically just this, all the server has to do is inspect the data that is sent. And of course, we implemented all of these and, and verified that they actually worked and so on. So the first password recovery. So remember that I mentioned we had these uh, four protocols, but we actually only saw two of them. So one of them looks like this. So the server will send a list of RSA public keys and some CHL, a random string. The user uses something uh, called RFC 1751 to compute a fingerprint, and what this does is that, or it hashes all of these keys first, and then it uses this RFC to compute a fingerprint. This RFC is an RFC from, I think, 94, that describes a way to turn a list of, or a, a string of bits into English words. Okay. Then it displays this fingerprint to the user, so the user gets involved in some uh, non-trivial way, like besides just inputting the password, and Supposing the user accepts, then you compute this layered encryption thing of the user's password and this challenge, uh, which looks interesting. Of course, the issue is pretty obvious here. You know, the server can, of course, be the one that picks this, these keys in the first place, and this will let him decrypt uh, the user's password when he sends it back. Although, this leaves out the question of this fingerprint. So, of course, this fingerprint, the way it's used here, it should be pretty obvious that it's basically some kind of uh, out-of-band authentication for uh, this list. And I think this is used in the enterprise product uh, for escrowing keys, but it can also be used in the single-user product, which is interesting. And the question is, of course, you know, what should you, the, the user be comparing this to, this, this fingerprint to? So this, this is uh, an I all right. So, so this is the question, right? If he has never seen this fingerprint before, which I think is a valid assumption if we run this against a user that is not supposed to, uh, or against a client that is not supposed to run this protocol, then he hasn't seen a fingerprint before, and of course, you know, what should he do? So SpiderOak takes this trust on first use, tofu approach for this, and this is the message that it is displayed together with this uh, fingerprint. It basically says that if you, if you have not been giving this fingerprint, then you should just click yes and move on. Of course, th this doesn't work in, in the case where, you know, you're a malicious server. So this, this authentication does nothing to get, or in, in this active case, I would argue. All right, so the file recovery. So it requires some, basic, or some quick observations about how uh, directory sharing happens in this application. So remember we had this tree 
or hierarchy of keys. Of course, the most efficient way to share a directory when you have this structure is to just reveal this directory key. And that's what SpiderWork does. So by simply revealing basically one uh, symmetric key, you can share gigabytes of data. So this is very efficient. Unfortunately, we found that when you move files uh, between directories, no encryptions are updated. Uh, and we also found that these directory keys are not updated. This, of course, leads to two scenarios that I think are very plausible. So first of all, suppose we have some directory with some files. This could be easily be like a directory with the vacation photos or something. Some of them are, I don't know, maybe too private to share with your colleagues or something. So you move them to a different directory and then you share the old one. So now you can show these photos. But from this observation too, this file that you move away is actually still shared with the old key. So when you reveal this to the server, as you do when you share this, the server can actually recover these different keys. A similar thing happens as a consequence of this observation three. If you have some shared directory and you stop sharing this, add new things to it, then these new things is encrypted with a key that the server still knows. And of course, the server can then recover this. And I think it's important to point out that in both these scenarios, the files that the server can recover are actually files that the user takes specific steps to avoid sharing. So it's not just random files, it's actually files that are, you know, the user doesn't want to share. So th this is all nice and, and so on. So, so this is the last password recovery, or the second one, the silent one. Um, I think this is bad enough in itself, but okay. So after installation, in order to avoid uh, having the user input his password on every year, you know, every time he starts up the application, uh, the client will write out the user's password in plain text on a file locally. Okay. Uh, I guess this, this is a problem if you, you know, are afraid of somebody stealing your computer or something like this. So we analyzed these RPC methods and we found an RPC method that given a file path will return this file's content if the file path matches a regular expression. Uh, and I guess you can see where this is going, right? Um, the file path for, uh, for the file containing the user's password matches this regular expression and the server can actually just ask for the user's password <laughs> and then it will, uh, the client will happily return this password or the file with the password in it. <sighs> yeah, okay. So I'll give my, because the original title of this was something about some lessons. So I'll give my, because I think all of these issues reveal some interesting, um, well-known, I think, uh, problems with developing software and anti-patterns, if you will. So first of all, I think this complexity plays a big role in this application. You know, all of these RPC methods, uh, different applications, pro uh, authentication protocols, and so on and so forth, uh, actually the last password recovery attack we found, the one where you could just ask for it, uh, the fix for that was to just remove these methods because they were not used. It was dead code, basically. Uh, there's this interesting issue, I think, of using the same secret for both authentication and encryption. Uh, and all the password recovery attacks was actually enabled by you know, using the password as an authentication uh, secret. If the password, or if you had a separate password for authentication and encryption, then um, breaking these authentication protocols would not be that big of a deal, because presumably all you would get there would then be encrypted data. There's some some moral about making assumptions about where what the user should do or how he should act in different uh, you know situations. And in particular, I, th I think the client should avoid making assumptions about the user. And I think that should hold or holds for most, most software. So the application where the client has to accept this strange fingerprint or the context where the client has to accept this strange fingerprint might make sense in the real um, situation or the correct situation where this is run. And it might make the application very insecure in the other one. So, and if you care about you know, security against a server that can behave as he, as he wants to, then of course this is something you have to consider and you cannot make these assumptions that the client should know what to do in, in every situation. So, this was what I talked about, basically. Finally, uh, I think that the main, or the main takeaway here, it should be that these cloud storage uh, services, the reason they do encryption on the client side is that they want to provide something more in terms of security. And I think it's, it's, it's sad that at least some of them actually don't have a threat model that captures this. 
and it, it makes it, you know, I think it makes it somewhat moot to, to make these statements and makes them, I don't know, empty. So, yep, that's it. Thank you, Anders. So we have a minute or two for some questions. Questions upstairs? Well, I have one. Was this all done manually by decompiling the Python and, and yep. looking carefully? No automated support to no. look at how 90 different RPC calls interact with each other? Yeah, so this is manual work. My. It's a bit sad because it doesn't uh, generalize very well manual work. <laughs> As a spider user, I appreciate it, so thank you. Okay, nice. Okay. You should just um, update to the newest version, I guess. So. All right, so let's thank Anders again. <laughs>